I'd like to welcome everyone to AHRQ's National Web Conference on the Role of Telehealth to Increase Access to Care and Improve Healthcare Quality. Although a few people are still logging in, we are going to go ahead and get started on time. My name is Commander Derek Wyatt, and I will be moderating this webinar. I currently serve as the Division of Digital Healthcare Research Grants Manager and the Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement at AHRQ. This slide shows the agenda for today's webinar. Please also note that we are recording this webinar, and the recording will be available via the AHRQ Health IT YouTube channel in a few weeks. Also, copies of the PowerPoint slides will be sent to participants via email following this webinar. We are pleased to have with us today an esteemed group of presenters. They include Dr. Glenn Jong, from the University of California at Davis, Dr. Elizabeth Ferrucci, Alaska Native Tribal Health Consultancy, and Dr. Kenneth McConaughey, University of Rochester Medical Center. This webinar event is accredited by Affinity CE. And for those of you who are interested in receiving continuing education credit for participating in this activity, information about how to claim your credit will be presented at the end of these presentations. It would also be emailed to you after this webinar. For the purposes of accreditation, let me note that AHRQ, TISTA, Affinity CE, Dr. Ferrucci, and Dr. McConaughey have no financial interest to disclose. Dr. Jong has financial affiliation with Walter Clore, BCBS, FEP, Doctors on Demand, and Safely View. Lastly, please note that no commercial support was received for the development of this learning activity. Just a brief note about questions. We have reserved time at the end of the presentations to address participant questions. However, during the presentations, feel free to submit questions that you have for the presenters using the Q&A panel located on the right of the PowerPoint slides. As a reminder, participants are in listen-only mode, so to ask questions, you will need to use the Q&A panel. This slide shows the learning objectives for today's webinar. By the end of this presentation, you should be able to discuss the effectiveness of telepsychiatry, evaluate the impact of telemedicine on the management of a chronic systemic disease, identify facilitators and barriers to urban telemedicine adoption, discuss how telemedicine can impact care during public health emergencies. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Glenn Jong. Dr. Jong is a clinical professor at the University of California at Davis. He is a board certified physician in internal medicine and psychiatry with 15 years of experience working in skilled nursing facilities. He currently provides psychiatric consultation on the appropriate psychiatric medication reduction and usage in nursing facilities in the greater Sacramento area. He has been involved in telemedicine research since 2010. And now it is my pleasure to turn it over to Dr. Glenn Jones. Thank you, Commander Wyatt, and thank you all out there for uh, tuning in to this webinar. Um, so the uh, presentation, or uh, also the title of our AHRQ uh, research project is Comparison of Asynchronous Telepsychiatry versus Synchronous Telepsychiatry in Skilled Nursing Facilities. Um, today, uh, as the study is still ongoing, what you're going to get is a preview of the study. Uh, we do have a baseline characteristics of the study, um, and the uh, data that you will also get is the pilot um, outcomes of our um, sort of feasibility study that we used as the preliminary data uh, for the AHRQ grant. So as a frame of reference, uh, uh, despite the sort of um, uh, really cool uh, sound of the uh, title, Synchronous Telepsychiatry. Synchronous Telepsychiatry 
uh, is really what uh, telepsychiatry is in practice uh, today, uh, where there is live uh, synchronous uh, video conferencing uh, between the uh, patient uh, and the uh, provider, in this case, the psychiatrist. So I am going to click on slide. Here we go. Uh, this is our uh, study team, and I'll uh, acknowledge other participants of our study team at the end of the presentation. Um, uh, let me uh, discuss uh, some of the uh, background uh, as well as the methods of our project, but also uh, the conceptualization um, of this uh, study. So. Uh, so telepsychiatry has is, is actually been in practice um, for quite some time, I would say at least uh, 20, uh, if not even longer than uh, maybe uh, 25 plus years. Uh, so uh, I uh, got very fortunate, uh, uh, I was exposed to uh, telepsychiatry research uh, uh, at the early stage of my career, uh, thanks to my mentor and colleague, Dr. Peter, Peter Yellowies. Um, he has a, a similar project uh, that I've just completed uh, in the primary care setting. So uh, just to look at the review of uh, some of the studies today. So as of 2015, uh, there's been about 130 plus uh, clinical studies looking specifically at telepsychiatry. There's been, I want to say, fairly extensive a very extensive study regarding the satisfaction with telepsychiatry, um, uh, and, and mostly um, because, uh, as you can see from the first bullet, that providers in general have concerns. They have concerns about whether uh, not having in-person care or having a video uh, um, modality to deliver care could potentially impair the uh, therapeutic relationship, or that it can get in the way uh, in, in sort of psychiatric terms in, uh, so, uh, in establishing a very good um, uh, therapeutic rapport. Now, on the other hand, um, there's uh, pretty good data that every time you ask the, the study participants or the patients themselves, uh, they, for the most part, report um, a fairly high satisfaction. And there, there's a number of sort of barriers which I didn't put on the slide, uh, but uh, the main issue there is just really the access, right? So patients on average wait uh, somewhere uh, between two to three months before they can get in to see a psychiatrist. Now, if you use telemedicine to reroute and reorganize your care, um, uh, not only do you uh, get away uh, with transportation issues, waiting issues, you're, you're, you're delivering care more efficiently. Um, patients don't have to travel hours uh, to get care. Uh, now, what about the clinical outcomes? Because that, that is the most important at the end of the day. Are people getting better? So there's been, so far, uh, 32 uh, randomized control studies, uh, uh, 13, though, uh, uh, only 13 studies have looked at clinical outcomes as uh, this particular review. The general consensus at this point is that telepsychiatry appears to be better than usual care. Uh, so by usual care, what that means is uh, 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 in, in some circumstances, it just depends on the study itself. It could mean uh, usual care means uh, a, that a person is getting medication through their primary care provider. Uh, or in other circumstances, they're waiting for long periods of time before they can get in to see psychiatrists. Um, so telepsychiatry then uh, obviously would, uh, 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 although not obvious until you study it, but it, it's reasonable to uh, sort of not be surprised with the outcome that telepsychiatry gives you better outcome because you're able to deliver the care. Um, with the exception that uh, there's been a few studies that have not shown that telepsychiatry is superior to uh, 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 usual care uh, because these folks with depression who are getting treatment in the primary care setting are also getting treatment. So telepsychiatry has not been shown to be better for the treatment of depression in primary care. Uh, in the studies that have looked at face-to-face -face comparison versus telepsychiatry, um, uh, telepsychiatry has, for the most part, uh, shown equivalent outcomes. 
Now, there's a slightly more rigorous design called a non-inferiority uh, design. Uh, the uh, scope uh, I won't be able to discuss in detail today. But in short, um, when you use a non-inferiority design, telepsychiatry perform as well, if not better than basic uh, based mental health services. There's generally not a real difference uh, if you sort of compare, well, uh, is it better to do pharmacotherapy via telepsych or telemental health or psychotherapy? There's not been uh, sort of obvious difference, uh, whether medication are better versus uh, psychotherapy. There's this really interesting study that was published in JAMA around the same time that shows that clearly, clearly that uh, telebehavioral health services when, uh, when you deliver, for example, psychotherapy, that participants are 18 times more likely to initiate uh, psychotherapy. So this is a really nice quantification of the fact that this is how much more likely are people to get care if you were to be able to deliver um, telehealth uh, specifically for psychotherapy. So um, with uh, with uh, the pandemic going on, it is we just can't get away with not talking about what happened. Uh, so um, some of you are out there, and uh, we were fortunate to actually publish this uh, at UC Davis that literally um, as we have sort of been using telepsychiatry to deliver a very small fraction of the services in our own clinic, that literally in a matter of a couple of weeks, um, um, in, in this specific article we said sort of um, so we, we were able to change all these visits uh, virtually uh, in, in as little as three business days. Uh, uh, some of the other folks are probably taking about a week, maybe two, or maybe three, but usually not more than a month. But you can, in fact, uh, switch nearly 100% of your uh, outpatient services and deliver them uh, virtually. So this is the comparison. Uh, so uh, the reason I bring this up is we actually um, use um, uh, this particular um, uh, sort of, we, we sort of knew that this was coming, that telepsychiatry was a, a very decent way to deliver care. Um, so uh, we picked that as our comparator. So in, in essence, rather than picking a usual care treatment, um, we picked synchronous telepsychiatry or STP as our comparison, or as our baseline comparison. So, um, Going back to the long-term care setting, so psychiatric disorders uh, can occur somewhere around 65 to maybe in other settings, even 90% of uh, long-term care uh, populations. Uh, we know uh, for, uh, given the current pandemic, uh, especially our uh, skilled nursing facility populations are also have exceedingly high, if not the highest uh, in terms of mortality from COVID. So uh, it's ever more important uh, to deliver good services to this population. There is a, just a dire uh, need for the delivery of psychiatric services to uh, skilled nursing facility residents uh, with psychiatric conditions. Uh, I would say one fifth is actually maybe a, a slight um, uh, sort of overestimate that, uh, that somewhere around, I would say, less than 20% uh, are as of these particular studies, but in my experience, um, and maybe even less than that, that a lot of folks out there are not currently getting psychiatric services, unfortunately, in the skilled nursing population. So going back to um, why we chose um, synchronous te uh, telepsychiatry, we certainly didn't predict that uh, you know, clinics would be delivering uh, telepsychiatry or 100% sort of for 100% of the services. But the issues that we were running into at the time uh, when we uh, sort of realized and when we're delivering telepsych uh, in sort of large volumes is that uh, there is often a need, uh, even for video telepsychiatry, to coordinate appointments. You need to make sure that uh, a set of uh, schedulers are at one end uh, and in the old days where there is very few um, telepsychiatry that is delivered directly to the home, the uh, patients will often have to drive 
to another clinical site. Uh, so, so there's still a little bit of um, driving and commuting going on uh, because uh, traditionally STP is not delivered to the home. Uh, so there, there's a need to essentially coordinate two sets of schedules. Sometimes that could be a barrier, especially when you run into technical issues. People work really hard to get to the appointment and there's a technical um, glitch uh, that people would have to make another appointment and do it all over again. There's also reimbursement challenges when it comes to uh, synchronous telepsychiatry. Telepsychiatry is, uh, is very difficult when you try to uh, sort of um, reimburse the provider on a sort of uh, PRN or ad hoc basis. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's just not feasible. You literally need to purchase or pay for um, and reimburse the provider for blocks of time. So just Comparing the two uh, modalities again, uh, synchronous telepsychiatry is essentially now the standard of care um, in a lot of practice settings, especially outpatient mental health. It is live, it is simultaneous, it is interactive. Um, it is a well-known um, method of delivering care, uh, more so than ever. And uh, there are, it is slightly underutilized, though, uh, administratively, although uh, right now, cost barriers are not uh, really there. Asynchronous telepsychiatry. So what this is, it is a video recorded psychiatric interview performed usually with a mental health clinician, uh, not a psychiatrist, but the video is later sent to a psych psychiatrist for uh, view. It is certainly uh, novel. Uh, definitely has not been studied uh, in a skilled nursing facility that we know of. And we believe that it may be more cost effective when compared to STP, but also, uh, you know, it, it uh, as alluded to, it sort of um, uh, bypasses logistical barriers. Uh, so in essence, that particular video recording becomes almost like a radiogram or a radiograph uh, in terms of what is happening in a moment in time uh, for the individual. And then the, the expert here, the psychiatrist, then reviews the field, makes a diagnosis, and then comes out with the intervention recommendation. So these are just more uh, diagrammatic uh, representations of what we have. This is uh, the uh, interviewer with the patient. This is uh, actually Dr. Yellow Lee's doing one of the consults. And here we are, uh, in, in essentially the treatment plan is delivered uh, uh, sort of from uh, the uh, computer, so to speak. We have now finished our um, study in the primary care setting. Uh, and uh, here's some just uh, brief um, Conclusions, we found that the psychiatrists may have more time, so actually they, they, seem, they seem to be writing more cons longer consult notes uh, with the ATP. Uh, the psychiatrists are, uh, for the most part, very comfortable with using ATP, and that ATP, uh, when compared to STP, certainly uh, was, no, uh, was not uh, worse than STP when used in the primary care setting. Now, I'm going to talk about essentially the exact uh, design um, uh, and the outcomes from our pilot study. So in our pilot study, we uh, uh, studied 40 participants in two nursing homes. Uh, as you can see, the uh, age is uh, uh, somewhere around 72 to 75 years old on average. Uh, and you saw um, over half of the participants had dementia and they had other uh, conditions. Uh, including depression, bipolar disorder, and schizophrenia. This is, uh, we had some uh, fairly reasonable uh, completion rates in the skilled nursing facility. And here are the results. So this particular art, uh, study uh, has been published in the um, uh, American Medical Director's uh, Journal of Long-Term Care. And I'm going to speed this up uh, a little bit uh, in the interest of time. So the bottom line is that both groups uh, improved. Uh, there is clinical as well as statistical significance. 
um, there were no um, uh, noted differences uh, when using ATP versus STP. The other interesting outcome is that uh, in the ATP group, um, as well as the STP group, we had some pretty remarkable recommendations to uh, reduce antipsychotic usage uh, in the stereosync facilities. Here's some uh, just uh, uh, small sample uh, in terms of satisfaction data that 60% uh, 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 plus of both groups uh, were uh, completely satisfied. That's rated as very high satisfaction. Um, again, this is a very small sample size. And this is just some of the same conclusions that I presented. So in our catalyst design, so um, uh, it is uh, a similar uh, parallel design randomized control study, although we are uh, currently active in nine sites. Um, we uh, aim to target 250 uh, participants. Currently, we're right at about a little over 200. So we, we sort of did, did uh, add an additional business just because we want to make sure that people are doing well uh, in the beginning. So rather than uh, sort of follow-ups three, every three months, uh, we ended up adding uh, monthly follow-ups um, for the first um, baseline and the first uh, three additional months. Our primary outcome is still the uh, CGI. Here's our um, sort of baseline characteristics. Uh, again, so far, the, uh, both groups uh, seemed uh, pretty um, equivalent. We're fortunate in this particular study that the, uh, sort of the prevalence of schizophrenia uh, is also uh, about the same for the two different groups. Okay, here's our study team. I hope you all uh, look for our study results, hopefully about a uh, year and a half to two years from now. Thank you very much for your time. Now I'm going to be passing this back to Commander. Okay, doc thank you, Dr. Young. As a reminder, we will be taking questions after our final presentation. So please submit any questions you have for Dr. Zhong using the Q&A panel. Okay, so we're going to move on to our second webinar pre presentation, which is being led by Dr. Elizabeth Ferrucci. Dr. Ferrucci is a rheumatologist and clinical researcher with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and Anchorage, Alaska. In the clinical setting, she practices adult rheumatology, incorporating field clinics and telemedicine for outreach to rural patients. Her research has focused on the epidemiology of autoimmune diseases in Alaska Native and American Indian people, as well as quality of care and access to care with a recent focus on telemedicine and rheumatoid arthritis and other chronic diseases. And now, I would like to turn the controls over to Dr. Ferrucci. Thank you very much. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to present our work on telemedicine and chronic disease specifically rheumatoid arthritis. Um, I would like to begin by reviewing some of the features of rheumatoid arthritis that make it important from a public health perspective and that complicate the use of telemedicine and its management. The photo on this slide is a patient of mine with longstanding rheumatoid arthritis. As you can see, she has significant deformities of her hands, which is a complication of longstanding disease. We now have treatments available that can reduce the likelihood of these deformities over time. Um, another thing demonstrated by this photo is the importance of functional status. The patient's able to continue beating despite her deformities. Our evaluations of rheumatoid arthritis focus on several aspects of the disease, including disease activity or active inflammation in the joints 
as well as damage due to longstanding disease and functional status. The goals of treatment are to reduce disease activity in order to prevent damage and preserve functional status. Um, as also noted on this slide, rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic autoimmune systemic disease. It can affect multiple joints of the body, with the small joints of the hands and feet being most commonly affected. The disease is associated with disability, as I mentioned, but also with increased mortality at a younger age um, related to a higher risk of cardiovascular disease in the study of chronic inflammation. The increase in risk of cardiovascular disease in rheumatoid arthritis is similar to diabetes, but not as widely known. Recently, studies have shown a benefit of a treatment strategy known as treat to target in rheumatoid arthritis. The strategy is somewhat complicated and involves calculation of a disease, disease activity score. There are several different scoring systems available, but they all typically require a detailed joint exam for tender and swollen joints. Um, because these targets are complex, uh, the strategy is best achieved through frequent visits with rheumatologists who are the specialists uh, managing this condition. Unfortunately, rheumatologists are in short supply in the United States and their, their practice is distributed mainly in large metropolitan areas. So there's limited access in rural areas of the country. Um, and then finally, my interest in studying care for rheumatoid arthritis in the Alaska Native population also stems from the fact that the prevalence of rheumatoid arthritis is higher in indigenous populations in the US and Canada than in other populations. Um, I'd like to give some background on the Alaska Tribal Health System, uh, where our study took place. The Alaska Native people are a diverse group of about 175,000 statewide, distributed over a vast geographic area. The vastness is well demonstrated in this slide, where Alaska is superimposed over the lo lower 48 um, states to scale. About 45% of Alaska Native people reside generally within the Anchorage region while the rest are in about 200 communities throughout the state, many of which are not on the road system. In rural and remote communities, people practice a subsistence lifestyle, which creates additional limitations for travel out of their communities during certain times of the year. Healthcare for Alaska Native people is provided by the Alaska Tribal Health System, made up of an affiliation of regional tribal health organizations statewide. These organizations receive funding from Indian Health Service, but operate under self-governance principles. There have been some innovations in healthcare in the Alaska tribal health system prior to telemedicine, such as a well-established and regulated network of local community health aides. Primary care is provided by the regional tribal health organization at village clinics, regional health clinics, and at the tertiary hospital for patients residing in the Anchorage area. Um, the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium is the statewide tribal health organization responsible for providing specialty care statewide among other services. Specialty care is provided using a combination of in-person clinics at the hospital in Anchorage, field clinics to approximately 12 regional hubs, and telemedicine. Rheumatology care is provided in the Alaska Tribal Health System using the model that I described for all specialty care with a combination of in-person visits at different sites as well as telemedicine. This slide demonstrates the location of all the rheumatology field clinics. These are typically visited twice a year for approximately three days, so this varies by location. Um, ANTHC's telehealth department has been in place since 1999. The initial focus was on asynchronous or store and forward telemedicine. Um, although the photo shows its use in dermatology here on the left, the initial emphasis was in ENT and use of video otoscope for follow-up after ear surgery. More recently, there's been a move towards synchronous telemedicine or live video visits, most commonly conducted clinic to clinic. The adoption of synchronous telemedicine began in around 2011, initially with a focus on cardiology, as shown in this photo, um, but then with um, a rapid expansion to multiple specialty clinics around 2015. In addition to these modalities, ANTHC's telehealth programs support education, including ECHO programs, live video visits to the patient's home, initially used for palliative care, as well as care coordination. 
Although outside the scope of the current study, there has been an increased use of all modalities, especially direct to patient during the recent pandemic. Um, adoption of telemedicine by the rheumatology community in general has been slower than some other specialties, largely because of the importance of the hands-on joint exam for diagnosis and management of many rheumatic diseases. This slide shows data from a systematic review that our group published in 2017, which included studies published through 2015. And actually a good comparison, our previous presenter mentioned 134 clinical studies in psychiatry through 2015. And as we can see here, there were only 20 studies identified through 2015 in rheumatology. And at that time, about half of those had been published prior to 2010. Although we have additional five years since that time, only a few other studies have been published. Of the studies described in the systematic review, only one was a randomized controlled trial. Um, use of rheumatology was more common in the follow-up phase of care than in initial diagnosis. Synchronous telemedicine was more common than asynchronous, often using a presenter trained in joint exam. And the most common diagnosis was rheumatoid arthritis, as shown in the red on the right, um, which mirrors um, the most common diagnosis in rheumatology practice in general. The study I will describe was designed to evaluate telemedicine in the setting of our usual practice uh, in rheumatology in the Alaska Tribal Health System. On this slide, I have some features of our usual practice outlined. Um, although we've become more flexible since the COVID-19 pandemic occurred, this description applies to our practice during the timeframe of the study, as well as what we believe are best practices specific to our healthcare setting. As a general rule, we use telemedicine in follow-up care rather than initial diagnosis for a few reasons. Um, first, I mentioned the hands-on exam is important, um, especially in the diagnostic phase of rheumatoid arthritis and other rheumatic diseases. Um, second, we value the in-person visit for relationship building. Um, we don't have any restrictions on what disease can be seen using telemedicine, but rheumatoid arthritis is the most common. Um, despite having the capability for asynchronous or store and forward or e-consult telemedicine, we've used primary, primarily synchronous or live video visits. Um, as I mentioned, there are multiple small villages in Alaska, so although we have a presenter on the patient end, this is not necessarily somebody that's specifically trained in a joint exam, um, because there are just too many of them um, to do that. Um, we have some other unique features of our usual practice. This includes having the patient at a remote clinic rather than at home, um, needing to work with multiple different sites, incorporating telemedicine visits throughout a clinic day interspersed with in-person visits rather than having a specific telemedicine day. Um, and um, alternating with in-person visits when possible at a field clinic site or other site. Uh, we also have an emphasis on continuity with the usual rheumatologist and the usual site of primary care. With that background, I'll tell you about the AHRQ-funded R21 study we recently completed. This study was designed to evaluate the impact of telemedicine care offered as part of usual practice on outcomes and quality of care for rheumatoid arthritis. Specifically, this included the first aim focused on disease activity using a patient-reported measure called the RAPID-3, and a second aim focused on several measures of access and quality of care for rheumatoid arthritis. For this study, we recruited people with a diagnosis of rheumatoid arthritis who were seeing a rheumatologist for follow-up care in the Alaska Tribal Health System, which could be either in person or by telemedicine. The study was observational and we were unable to assign participants to a group, so we defined the groups as ever versus never having used telemedicine for rheumatoid arthritis. At baseline, we collected the RAPID-3, which I mentioned as a patient-reported ac disease activity measure, as well as a telemedicine perception survey. We also conducted medical record abstraction for disease characteristics and baseline quality measures. We contacted participants by telephone at 6 and 12 months with the RAPID-3 um, repeated at each time point and the telemedicine survey repeated at 12 months only. We completed a second medical record abstraction at 12 months to assess measures of quality of care. Recruitment for this study was from August 2016 to March 2018 and follow-up was completed in March 2019. This, slide, this table on the slide shows factors associated with telemedicine use and people enrolled in our study. As I mentioned, the study was observational and we were not able to assign people to an intervention. 
So we expected that there might be differences between groups. What we found, as shown here, is that people who were seen by telemedicine had higher disease activity scores, which is the rapid three, more positive perceptions of telemedicine based on a composite survey score, higher mean rheumatologist telemedicine score, which was a measure of what proportion of visits the rheumatologist conducted by telemedicine, as well as a higher number of rheumatologist visits in the year prior to study enrollment. This may indicate that when telemedicine is offered as part of usual care, patients with better disease control may prefer to wait longer for in-person visits, while those who have higher symptom burden may be more likely to choose telemedicine. Also, patient and provider acceptance appear to be important determinants. Um, this shows, slide shows our findings from AIM-1, which focused on the change in the RAPID-3 score over the 12-month study period. As I mentioned previously, the baseline RAPID-3 was higher in the telemedicine group, which is shown in blue on this graph, than in the in-person group shown in red here. When we looked over the 12-month period, there was no significant change over time in either group. In multivariate models, we found an association between RAPID-3 and group, uh, so, meaning it was higher in the telemedicine group, and with age, but no association with time. We looked at disease activity and functional status two other ways and found no difference in either of these by group or by time. That included the proportion of participants in low disease activity or remission, as well as the functional status score. Um, the table on this slide shows the quality measures compared between groups with telemedicine in the first column and in-person only in the second. There are a few things to point out. First, I showed you at baseline the telemedicine group had more visits in the year prior to study enrollment. However, during the 12 months of the study, the number of rheumatologist visits was similar by group. Second, there were no statistically significant differences in any of these quality measures by group, except the proportion of visits in which disease activity was documented by the rheumatologist at the visit, which was lower in the telemedicine group. However, this was no longer significant in multivariate analysis. The study had some limitations. The most significant limitation was the inability to randomize to telemedicine or not, given its widespread availability in clinical practice at the time of the study. Um, although we attempted to control for these factors, we may not have been able to completely adjust for them. In addition, as an R21 grant, it had a very limited time frame and small number of participants. It's possible that differences between groups would be seen with a larger study or longer duration. Um, although I mentioned that it was challenging to anticipate changes in clinical practice, we were lucky, though, that no major changes occurred in the middle of our study. But this type of study can be very difficult. We've seen dramatic changes in telemedicine use associated with the COVID-19 pandemic, and the results of our study could have been affected by that if it were in the more recent time period. Based on this, this study, we were able to draw some conclusions about telemedicine follow-up of rheumatoid arthritis. We found that it could be useful in management of rheumatoid arthritis and was more likely to be used by patients with more active disease, patients with more favorable views of telemedicine, as well as patients who were seeing providers who use telemedicine more often. We found no clear differences in quality of care or disease activity in the short term, but our hypothesis is that if telemedicine allows for patients to see rheumatologists more often, it's possible that it could improve the outcomes of rheumatoid arthritis. Um, in addition to this study, we've been working on some broader questions about the use of synchronous video telemedicine in chronic disease specialty care in the Alaska Tribal Health System. Uh, the benefits or pluses and barriers or minuses listed on this slide are summarized based on a medical student summer research project. Our student, Nikki Jordan, conducted a qualitative study consisting of semi-structured interviews with patients and providers about their views on video telemedicine. As shown here, avoiding travel and associated costs was perceived as the greatest benefit of telemedicine, given the broad geographic distribution of this population. Other benefits included improved communication, both patient to provider and provider to provider, and increased access to care, allowing for more frequent visits. Um, commonly identified barriers were the difficulties related to performing a physical exam, privacy concerns, technical difficulties, the need for a trained presenter, and scheduling complexity. Sorry. Back to the right slide. Um, so um, the qualitative data that I presented in the last slide was pre-COVID-19. 
This slide illustrates how prior to the pandemic, for many organizations, the barriers of starting to use telemedicine seemed to outweigh the benefits. Although the benefits were well recognized, some logistical barriers appeared to be major hurdles for healthcare organizations. Um, it's important to note that the balance of benefits versus barriers depends on the local context. So in our setting, the burden of travel was greater than in other settings, while reimbursement for telemedicine was favorable um, in Alaska, all of which sort of tips the balance toward the benefits earlier in rural Alaska than elsewhere. Um, but what we've seen happening with the arrival of the COVID-19 pandemic is a shift everywhere in the balance of benefits and barriers related to use of telehealth. Um, several regulatory barriers were removed related to the pandemic with respect to HIPAA compliant platforms as well as reimbursement. And an additional benefit was added of safety and the ability to allow for physical distancing, which has really tipped the balance toward benefits for virtually every healthcare organization. This has led to rapid uptake of telemedicine globally. Um, anecdotally, as this has occurred, we've seen several other barriers being removed, including both patient and provider acceptance as they become more familiar with telemedicine and see the benefits, especially that of convenience. Um, our local um, ANTHC chief information officer uh, was recently quoted in our, the newspaper as saying, it feels like the genie's been let out of the bottle and it'll be hard to put it back, meaning that now that we've expanded telemedicine in many new ways, it's likely to continue rather than going back to pre-pandemic patterns of use. Um, data from many sources support the increase of telemedicine and the increased interest in its use, which is likely to lead to additional research in this area. Um, I'd like to end by briefly describing our future research plans in this area. The R21 study I described focused on rheumatoid arthritis, but we also have an AHRQ-funded R01 that started in April 2019 focused on specialty care provided by telemedicine for a broader set of chronic conditions. We have three study aims as shown here that focus on the predictors, outcomes, and costs associated with telemedicine for chronic disease specialty care. This ongoing project is a mixed method study with qualitative data collected from patients and providers, as well as quantitative data from medical records. Um, we completed data collection for AIM-1, focused on predictors of telemedicine use in our first year. Um, now we expect that to change dramatically, of course, after the pandemic. Fortunately, we had a reassessment built into our timeline before the end of the five-year grant, so we will be able to continue as planned and provide useful data about changes in predictors of use over time. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge our funding for these projects as well as thank our study participants and our research team. Um, the people listed have, here have worked on various aspects of our telemedicine research. Thank you very much um, to our moderators and to AHRQ today. And here's my contact information. Thank you, Dr. Ferrucci, for that great presentation. As a reminder, please feel free to submit any questions you have using the Q&A panel at this time. Moving on to our final presentation of this webinar, which is being led by Dr. Kenneth McConaughey. Dr. McConaughey is a pediatrician and a health service researcher who recently retired following a 49-year career as a primary care pediatrician and developer of telemedicine for primary care. His commitment to improving access to high-quality care was, was nurtured by his experience in the National Health Service Corps, where he was assigned to serve in Lowndes County, Alabama. He completed a pediatric residency at the University of Rochester Medical Center and a fellowship in general academic pediatrics. He was a faculty member in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Rochester since 1979 until his recent retirement. And now I would like to turn the control over to Dr. McConaughey. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, the, um, my plan today is, uh, first of all, to examine the capacity and limitations of distinctly different telemedicine models. Uh, I want to go 
I'm going to go on to describe our model, which I call information-rich connected care. And then I'm going to review the evidence supporting effectiveness and efficiency of information-rich connected care as used in primary care, especially our experience for uh, its use in primary care with children. Let's see. Um, going right to um, our uh, most important evidence, in our first clinical initiative, we ventured into inner city child care. That was kind of an obvious place to start because illness and child care is a hassle for all parties involved, for parents, for children, for child care staff, and health care providers. In the early 2000s, in the pediatric primary care practice within our medical center, hardly a day would go by when we weren't asked to do an office visit to certify that a child who was obviously well by that time, was fit to return to daycare. Just doesn't make sense. Sometimes a child had been well for several days. It just took that long for the mom to find time she could take off from work to bring the child in for that certification. So the child care setting was low-hanging fruit, if you will. Uh, these are results from a cohort study of absence from five city child care centers, telemedicine, was rolled out in staggered fashion among the five centers so that we had both concurrent and historical controls as we tracked attendance and reasons for absence over a three-year period. On the vertical axis, let me go back there. On the vertical axis, axis we have absences due to illness per 100 child years of registration. As you can see in this figure, rates for absence due to illness were much less with telemedicine than before it. Rates in winter months with telemed in yellow were down to a level that prevailed in summer before telemed, in, which is in blue. For almost all families using childcare, of course, absence from childcare also means absence from work in many cases, in many cases, um, absence of income. I think many people would consider this our most important finding. Um, Over the subsequent day, decade, I'm not sure why we're um, not advancing the slides. Let's see, still having trouble run a temporary application to join this meeting immediately, so I'll click on that. You shouldn't have to run anything. Just click on the slides and then use the space bar to go forward. Okay. So just click once or twice on the screen where, you're, where you see your slides, and then you should be able to use the space bar. Um, I, on my screen, it says starting WebEx. Still having trouble running a temporary application to join this meeting immediately. No, you've, already, you've already joined into WebEx. Well, I know that. I know that. Are you able to see the WebEx window that's open with your slides? I'm not able to see the window that's open with my slides. Um, yeah, the circle's going around and around, and... Uh, it gives me the option, if I'm still having trouble, to run a temporary application to join this meeting immediately. Yeah, go ahead and uh, run a temporary application. See if that'll allow you to get back in. You want me to go do that? Yeah. Sorry, everyone, for the technical difficulties.
And let me know when you can see the slides. Sorry, no slides appearing. And are you currently in the WebEx where you can see the, um, the presentation window? Um, it says starting WebEx and there's a you know, circle with the blue portion going around and around. And below that it says still having trouble, run a temporary application to join this meeting immediately. Okay. Well, if you have a printed copy of your slides or if you have a copy in front of you, I could advance the slides yeah. for you as you continue to do your presentation. So okay. currently we um, are on the slide that says visits completed, 14,000, or, yeah. Yes, yes, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, everybody. Over the next decade or so, um, over, over the subsequent decade, the service has expanded from child care to other convenient sites, and its value has been assessed in various ways. Feasibility and acceptability, effectiveness, and efficiency of this model are now well established. Along the way, we have enabled over 14,000 visits. Altogether, we've used greater than 70 different access sites, including all uh, schools in the city of Rochester. Following success in childcare and schools, we started doing visits in a center for children with special needs, and then an after hours neighborhood telemedicine access sites. Um, our experience included has included 97% of telemedicine visits are completed with only 3% of requests for visits ultimately leading to referrals to a higher level of care and that's because the physician uh, was not comfortable with the uh, being able to arrive at uh, an explanation in other words a diagnosis for what was going on and or uh, needed further information to decide on uh, what what treatment should be implemented. Parents have told us that for the vast majority of telemedicine visits, that's 94%, were it not for the visit, they would have gone to the emergency department, an urgent care center, or the office. 93% of parents said that their child's most recent telemedicine visit, telemed visit allowed them to stay at work, saving an average of four and a half hours for each time they were saved time lost from work. Um, next slide. A provider from the child's own primary care medical home completed 83% of visits. Focus groups and surveys indicate that parents value being seen by one of their regular providers, although not as much as they value the convenience of the telemedicine visit itself. Uh, we tried very hard to uh, get as many of the uh, primary care providers around the city of Rochester to participate, and, and we were successful to a substantial extent, but some people held out for a while. With the promise of enhanced reimbursement for achieving medical home criteria, including visits within the medical home, provider organizations um, um, perhaps were motivated by uh, by that uh, enhancement. Uh, additional observations include completion of telemed visits by providers from ten from ten different primary care practices, and that has included over seventy different providers. Telemed visits have been reimbursed ultimately by all local payers, including Medicaid managed care. Um, leaving uncovered only children with fee-for-service Medicaid, but that was uncommon in the Rochester area. Um, notably, children with telemed access from childcare or elementary school made 22% fewer ED visits than closely matched counterparts. Uh, for children with special health care needs, this reduction in ED visits was 50%. Next slide. Regarding potential for high quality via telemedicine, this number, 85% of offices for illness are appropriate for telemedicine. That's based on an early study of ours in which almost 500 children were seen in our office and either immediately before that face-to-face -face office visit or immediately after also seen by telemedicine. 
85% is the proportion for which the telemedicine doc was entirely comfortable and convenient in making diagnostic and treatment decisions. Equally important, we demonstrated that telemed versus in-person decisions were as similar as for those between two in-person docs seeing the child independently. That's clearly a metric to support our claim of in-person equivalence. Um, and the last bullet, based on a review of primary care diagnoses for children seen in our emergency department, we estimate that at least 40%, at least 40% of pediatric ED visits are appropriate for our telemedicine model. And that's in a medical community, Rochester, that has long had a commitment to primary care pediatrics, pediatrics and has had a low rate of ED visits for children. Next slide. Of course, the first question one should ask about any innovation is, above all, um, can we do, be sure we're doing no harm? Serious illness in children can be subtle, especially in young children. So in telemedicine to evaluate acute, acute illness in kids, safety is one of the first questions that we need to address. We address this issue in various ways in our studies, but it's important to know that our findings supporting safety have been confirmed by other researchers in other settings. This study recently published in pediatrics, not so recently anymore, <laughs> offers the clearest answer to the question of safety. Um, let's see. That's the one we, I just talked about. My apologies. Um, to me, our most promising finding our most exciting finding, frankly, is demonstrated in this slide. These data support the hypothesis that our telemed model has the potential to play an important role in improving equity, equity and access to care, and to make a substantial contribution towards a more equitable society. Um, in a fair society, one would expect lower SES status lower SES inner city kids to see doctors for illness at least as often as suburban kids, because we know that frequency of severity and severity of illness for lower SES kids is greater than for relatively affluent suburban kids. We assess visit rates of study children for visits of all types, office visits in blue, ED visits in red, and telemed visits in green for suburban, inner city, and rest of city children both before or without telemedicine, and then after or with telemedicine. Without telemedicine, total illness visits for suburban children were substantially greater than for any inner city children, 449 visits per 100 child years versus 328. Despite the known greater morbidity burden among inner city children, uh, as an example of that greater morbidity burden, a number of years ago, we found that asthma hospitalization rates for children from Rochester's inner city were almost fourfold greater than Rochester area suburban children. Sorry. In contrast, with telemedicine available, total illness visits for inner city children increased to a level beyond that of suburban children. 519 versus 449. And the rate of ED visits for any city children decreased substantially. And that was a highly statistically significant drop from 89 uh, visits per 100 child years to 66 visits. In Rochester, the socioeconomic status of rest of city children is intermediate between that of inner city inner city and suburban children. Changes in the distribution of visits without versus with telemedicine for rest of city children follows the same pattern as for inner city children. For total visits with telemed available, um, total visits increased from 377 to 435 to a level almost equal to that of suburban children, 449. And ED visits dropped significantly from 86 to 64. Next slide. Um, clearly, telemedicine has been getting more and more attention these days, and even more so recently with the 
uh, current epidemic, much more so than we started in this arena over 16 or 17 years ago. Here's a recent example of marketing with the brand name crossed out that appeared in my inbox almost oh, a few years ago now. Um, marketing focused on value. Value is a central issue in several respects. The claim of this pitch is that telemedicine, in, in the smaller, smaller print, telemedicine is a key initiative towards achieving the triple aim and a shift to value-based reimbursement. And telemedicine is rightfully gaining traction in the market with key stakeholders. The triple aim, of course, is better care and improved community health at lower cost. For me, this marketing begs two issues. First, is it true or false that telemedicine enables a shift to value-based care? Before we can answer that question, we first need to identify those values we're here to serve. In many ways, for physicians to shift to a distinctly different process for delivering care turns out to be a big bother. And as we will discuss, it requires changes in organization and financing that are beyond the control, not only of individual, individual medical practices, but also of large provider organizations. On the other hand, care that can be much more convenient and less costly than the office, especially much less costly than the emergency department and even an urgent care center, might be much more valuable to, parent, to patients and to society as a whole. Second, value and quality are central issues. And what is quality? Value is essentially bang for your buck. So to assess value, one must define quality. Quality from the patient's perspective is whatever you might gain from your investment in time, hassle, and money that's involved in obtaining, obtaining the health services for you or your, or your child. In other words, what you might gain as a consequence of this experience with telemedicine, with a telemedicine visit. So what's quality? Benefit from the care actually provided is key to a patient's perspective of value, of course. More convenient care entails less hassle and consumes less of your time. So that's certainly relevant to value. The value is surely about more than lifting the burden of inconvenience and hassle. No parent would choose, would choose telemedicine on the basis of convenience alone if they knew they were suggesting their child to care that risked poor outcome. So to answer the question of whether telemedicine truly does enable a shift to value-based care, we need to consider quality in the occasion. That leads us to the triple aim perspective on value. The triple aim, going from, clockwise from the upper left, includes improving the health of the population at lower costs in the aggregate and at the same time delivering better care. This conceptual framework addresses the issue of value and quality from the community and from the patient perspective. Improving health of the individual is important for both the person and for society, and to the extent that better care contributes to improving health, so is better care. Lower costs for all this, of course, produces more bang for the buck, in other words, greater cost effectiveness. And again, it's important to understand that costs include both direct and indirect costs. Anxiety, time lost from work or school, cost to deliver services are all encompassed when one considers cost in the broad sense that economists, academic economists anyway, consider cost. Okay, so what's better care? In particular, what is good or better care as delivered via telemedicine? Why should it be any different from care delivered in person. All good, three, all good things come in threes, right? So we can look at sustainability of telemedicine from that perspective. The first pillar, pillar of sustainability is the technology. In a sense, that's the easy part. The technology has been developed, it's readily available, and I'll show you some of the important things that technology can do in a bit. The next pillar, the middle pillar, is incentives. Incentives of all key stakeholders must be served. Um, who are the key stakeholders? First of all, of course, are the patients and their families, and there's the healthcare professionals, the doctors and nurses who deliver the service, and then there's the provider organizations, 
the medical centers and medical practices that employ these professionals. Then the final pillar required to sustain an innovation is governance, laws, regulations, and traditions that determine how technology is used to deliver services. Next slide. Um, it seems like common sense to me that good care is good care regardless of the setting in which it is delivered. If we can use telemedicine tools to diagnose health problems as accurately and to manage them as well as we can with care delivered in person, then we have achieved in-person equivalence. If diagnosis and management is as good as in-person care and the process is completed in the manner that is more convenient to the patient, then overall the quality is better. Having addressed conceptually what we're trying to achieve, I'm going to move on to exactly how our care model works and what it means to families on a day-to-day -day basis. Here, for example, is say your 10-year-old daughter or granddaughter when you dropped her off at childcare this morning on the far left. And in the middle, here she is when she wakes in the, in the middle of nap time, holding her ear with a temperature of 104. Of 104. Fortunately, her childcare program has telemedicine, a telemedicine unit, so your primary care, your very own primary care pediatrician sees her within an hour. Um, and um, she identifies the problem as an ear infection. You can see the eardrum image immediately below. She gets pain medication right away from the stock they keep on hand, and she gets her first amoxicillin dose delivered by the pharmacy to childcare within an hour after that. And then in the far right, here she is the next morning, ready for you to drop her off again at childcare. Very briefly, here are some of the operational details. Over here in the far left is what happens at, at the child site, upper left. The telemedicine assistant captures images or video clips of various body parts, and they capture lung sounds with an electronic stethoscope. The telemedicine assistant also contributes history of the present illness based on information obtained from a parent and from child site staff. Digital files are stored in an electronic record on a central server. This stored information can be downloaded by a provider located anywhere with internet access. Both synchronous and asynchronous information exchange are essential to the model. These, the, the, two, um, sorry, the two clinicians on the upper right are assessing images and lung sounds that have been stored at the child site and then uploaded at the clinician site. Clinicians can interact in real time with children, staff, and parents as shown in the video conference windows. Here in the lower right is a child site staff person as seen from the clinician site, and here in the lower left is a clinician as seen from the child site. Keep in mind that parents are most often at work when the child is seen at school or childcare by telemedicine. I don't feel like I've done my job as a provider until I have at least spoken to the parent by phone to elicit more history and discuss my recommendations. Ideally, the real-time interaction involves a multi-way video conference, often with child, parent, and provider all at different sites. With the secure video conference applications now available, there are no technical barriers to making this happen. Next slide. Understandably, people have asked about the accuracy of diagnoses made via telemedicine. Many of you will recognize this as a normal eardrum. Our experience indicates that telemedicine diagnosis, if done right, can be as accurate as in-person medicine, if not more so. I'm going to show you next a bunch of eardrum images to let you decide. As you know, eardrum infections are very common uh, among children, and they are by far the most common reason for antibiotic prescription. Um, this image here is just, uh, just in case you've forgotten what a normal eardrum looks like. Here we have acute otitis media, as most people have never seen it. I can assure you that uh, 
I see clinically important details here that I've never seen in the 40 years of looking uh, at eardrums with a typical handheld otoscope. I think it's very likely that ears such as these, which reveal middle ear fusion but not a, an acute ear infection, are currently being interpreted at least by people not using, by people using the traditional handheld otoscope, they're being interpreted as acute otitis media. And of course, that in turn leads to unnecessary antibiotic use, which in the aggregate is harmful because it selects out resistant, antibiotic, um, resistant bacteria. Next slide. Um, uh, displays in a way what we've done with our telemedicine model over a period of 13 years. The rows represent calendar years with 213, um, including 2013, including just the last six months of that year. On the bottom two rows, you see the total numbers and the percents for each type of site. Cells before service was initiated are blank. That's in the upper. Um, upper right hand triangle, sort of. Uh, there's a lot of history reflected in this table. Each different type of site, those listed across the top, has its own history. The key points for now are that this care model is useful in a wide variety of community access sites. Interest among city families was greater than among, than among suburban families. And there's a lot of influences on scale up and spread of this service that have nothing whatsoever to do with what's good for children and families. Next slide is the distribution of primary diagnoses for almost 14,000 acute visits completed over the observation period. This distribu distribution is quite similar to that found in national surveys of pediatric office visits. You see acute otitis media at the top. Um, one of the key points I'd like to convey is reflected schematically here. To deliver high quality service, service that meets the standard of in-person equivalence, you need to match the requirements, requirements for clinical information that's important to managing the clinical issue at hand with connected care tools that can provide that information. For visits just described, we did just that. In this figure, possible information requirements are represented on the horizontal axis from left to right. The vertical axis represents the broad range of tools that we might use in obtaining information for making diagnostic and management decisions. These tools range in their capacity to provide key information from spare to abundant, spare on the bottom and abundant on the, on the top of the, the axis, the vertical axis. Along that range, we might play, play place various connected care and traditional healthcare models as at the left of the vertical axis. Starting at the lower left, starting at the lower left, we have text only. People use texting all the time. Um, level two, well, let's skip to level, level three, which is video, confirm, video conference only. You can do a lot with video conference in, in terms of communication, but you can't listen to lungs, you can't look at ears, you can't get a high quality image of a rash. Um, so the next level, level four, is what I call information rich, and that's basically what we tried to provide. Um, you, you, you can only do very limited laboratory tests with our model. But um, we did a few rapid streptococcal antigen tests, um, swabs, which we sent to the lab for, um, for fungal cultures, for example. And then, you know, level five and level six are what, you, um, what we would call traditional services. Um, why is real-time video interaction important? Several reasons, I think. Much of the time, the most valuable service you offer as a clinician is reassurance. And capacity to reassure depends on, to reassure depends on trust. Trust in diagnostic decisions and treatment recommendations 
is strongly influenced by communication skills. Surely, if you, you're talking to over the phone, even to somebody you've known over years um, and developed a trusting relationship with, then the phone might be adequate. But if you're talking with someone you don't know that well, um, that communication is going to be enhanced substantially with facial expression, with uh, uh, body language. Uh, that's important. Those are important in order to convey genuine concern and, and what I would call accurate empathy. Um, very quickly, um, to, uh, I'm going to run through review slides that um, um, are part of what was called, what is called the reading the mind and the eyes test. Um, this person whose eyes you see only is playful. Next person doesn't trust you. Next person is kind of concerned. Um, the, the question is, oh, the point, the point is really that uh, when you see somebody, when you're looking at somebody face to face, particularly looking at their eyes, you're um, receiving information and, and, and they are receiving information that you can't get with verbal communication only. And that's one good reason why I think it's, it's important to include video conferencing. Um, that's the reading, those, those images were based on uh, reading the mind and the eyes test, which, uh, by the way, differentiates people with autism from people who do not have, who are not on the autism spectrum. And uh, people who, who are not on the spectrum are much better at reading uh, emotion in the eyes than people on, on the spectrum, so-called. Okay, um, finally, some slides which compare usual care versus our telemedicine model, healthy, the healthy, ex healthy access model. With usual care, the child usually seen four hours after the concern arises at best, and the first medication dose six hours later. With tele our healthy access, access model in child care of schools, the child seen as soon as the problem is identified almost. Um, uh, the first made pain medication is given shortly thereafter, first antibiotic, which the pharmacies would deliver to the child care center within an hour. Um, next slide, cost to the community, usual care versus our telemedicine model with usual care. There's the cost of the urgent care or ED exam room space. There's personnel costs, nurses, med techs. The parent misses a half a day a week of work at least. There's a transportation cost, sometimes by ambulance. There's, there's parking costs, payment to the emergency department, which in the Rochester area back then was um, about $800 per visit. There's a med cost and a provider cost. Comparing that with our telemedicine model, information rich telemedicine model, there's little or no cost for the patient exam room space because the child's already there in, in, in daycare. The, there's the patient and equi equipment and connectivity, which is moved from one child care to, the, to another child care by the roaming telemedicine assistant. There's no incremental cost for provider space and equipment. The personnel cost is the med tech, who we call the, the telemed assistant and the scheduler. There's there are no transportation costs or parking costs. The parent misses no work. Payment for the telemedicine visit, same as for an office visit, say 90 bucks. There's a medication cost, which is equal, and there's a provider cost, which is equal or less. Um, interesting, I think it's usually less because so much of the information has been acquired already. You don't have to look in the eardrum yourself. You don't have to clean the wax out of the ear. Um, you just look at the images, and that's a quick glance. Next slide. From um, societal perspective, uh, telemedicine, there's a lot more bang for the buck. Um, much greater impact, much lower cost than usual care. Next slide. Um, is this a patient-oriented system of care? Good question. Um, we, 
um, we're in a community we, where the dominant insurer in our, in our community was working with video only telemedicine. Um, and they were promoting that nationwide. The goal, their goal was to reduce emergency department and urgent care visits. The insurer believed that the prime sites for patients using the system would be home and work. The insurer was agnostic, didn't care whether it was home or work. Um, they liked the work, work site availability because um, um, that was a very important to local employers. Consumer focus groups conducted by that insurer indicate that patients want their own doctors to be, wanted their own doctors to be participating. Um, video one insurer, um, however, was going to have a backup virtual network that could be assessed, could, that could be accessed by the insurer's patients if the patient's own physician did not sign up. Um, is that a patient-oriented system? Well, video one, video only number one efforts were also targeted toward, were targeted toward minor acute illness, which is very common, that's patient-oriented. Major, the major insurer believed that most local physicians would participate. Uh, the, the insurer stressed that the Kaiser system, there are more virtual, at that time, there are more virtual than face-to-face -face visits but actually that was only dermatology. Um, there was a major supermarket chain whose pharmacy is a major profit center. Um, that that organization formed a, an alliance. Uh, the, the major medical center in this in this community has been approached by that, had been approached by that supermarket chain. Um, and we didn't know whether the technology would be enriched to meet the real information requirements beyond those of video interaction. And still, um, people are promoting telemedicine when they're, as telemedicine, video only, which I pointed out has lots of limit, limitations. Um, who staffs these access sites? What's the organizational architecture? Is the service exclusive to patients of a particular provider organization? Will all insurance organizations for telemed visits pay for telemed visits, but sites will be used as access sites. Will they open it up to uh, where the, the most convenient sites, like childcare, like schools, like workplace? Um, this payer, um, let's see. A key factor here was uh, in their notice that they sent around to all providers, um, was that reimbursement will be at 50% of their usual rate. And, you know, that's not going to uh, encourage providers, primary care providers, to adopt telemedicine. Uh, so that's hardly a strong endorsement. Um, that's one reason why everyone wasn't using prime telemedicine for primary care. Um, one uh, uh, piece that I came across in, in uh, um, the media, uh, widely distributed, was that uh, was states that uh, why is you know asking the question why isn't everyone using it for primary care? Even though it could save money, that's not what's happening. It tends to be in addition. You do the telemedicine, it leads to more tests, it leads to more follow visits. Well, that could well be true for some telemedicine models, but it certainly was not true for our telemedicine model. Um, next, uh, when you look at the data, it turns out the telemedicine overall is not necessarily a big cost saver. Uh, well, again, it can be, but it depends on the model that's adopted. Um, one way to think about telemedicine and its adoption is to think more broadly about um, what uh, some economists have called disruptive innovations and the dissemination of disruptive innovation. Um, this is from a book called The Innovator's Prescription, A Disruptive Solution for Healthcare by Clayton Christensen, Jerome Grossman, and Jason Huang. 
all based in Boston. Um, they define disruptive innovations as cheaper, simpler, more convenient products and services that start by meeting the needs of less demanding customers. The process of disruptive innovation diminishes the value of established companies that previously controlled the market for a particular product or service. That is, they held some level of monopoly power. But it's necessary, disruptive innovation is necessary for long-term economic growth because companies with sufficient control over a particular product, sufficient control to substantially shape the terms on which other individuals access the care, obstruct, access the, the product, obstruct the innovation required for economic growth. Sufficient control to substantially shape the terms on which other individuals access the product. Frankly, that sounds precisely like the medical center where I used to work um, was behaving. The barriers fall in three categories. Failure to differentiate among telemedicine models and their capacity to achieve in-person equivalence. Next, entrenched financial interests in traditional care models and fee-for-service financing favoring emergency department visits. So, I mean, why wouldn't the emergency department prefer visits that uh, paid them 800 bucks versus 80 bucks? In contrast, value-based financing, recognizing the clinically important differences in capacity of various telemedicine value models and understanding the process of disrupting disruptive innovation may help to overcome barriers. I think this theory has a lot to offer towards explaining the slow, outcome, slow uptake of telemedicine in primary care and what needs to happen for it to become more widespread. Um, what else does the conceptual framework mean in concrete terms? Um, well, you need to understand state-specific regulations. You need to identify a HIPAA-compliant technology platform. Um, you need access sites with convenient office, office hours, particularly after, after hours sites. Um, you need to articulate phone triage guidelines that identify what parent concerns what patient concerns are appropriate for telemedicine and what concerns um, need to uh, lead to guiding them directly to either call 911 or, or go to the emergency department if there's no other option. Um, establish appropriate financing, obviously. Promote it. You need to promote it to patients, um, both the process and, and the payment. Um, lessons learned are really confirmed um, by our experience, I think. First of all, the secret to the care of the patient is caring for the patient, and that's difficult to do with texting-only telemedicine. Um, uh, next is, um, I think, the problem with common sense is not that common, and I think in many ways the, uh, um, you know, texting-only telemedicine is uh, just not common sense. Um, and finally, first they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. That was Mahatma Gandhi. And I think um, maybe it took a, a, a COVID-19 epidemic to um, bring conditions to the point where many people who previously <coughs> opposed telemedicine um, are now promoting it. Um, and um, finally, the last slide, here's promotion that came from <coughs> Rochester area dominant provider organizations uh, promoting telemedicine. And thank you for your time and attention. Bye. Thank you, Dr. McConaughey. And thank you again to all of our presenters for their very informative presentations. As a reminder, um, look like we're getting close to the end of our presentation, uh, so we're not going to be able to get to many of the questions today. Uh, what our plan is is to be able to answer each of these questions and send them out later uh, via email. Uh, I do want to take the time to at least ask one or two quick questions to Dr. Zhang. Um, and Dr. Zhang, just quickly, 
um, we had a participant that asked, uh, what training or clinical background should an ATP interviewer have? Great. Um, thank you for that uh, specific question. I would say that is the most common question that we uh, get. Um, so specifically, the, um, the interviewer um, uh, can go off of a script, right? So they, they could certainly be licensed. They could be a licensed social worker, uh, uh, primary care doctor, uh, any other sort of uh, licenses. Uh, but uh, more so, they, they can also uh, have been somewhat involved in healthcare. Uh, they need to care about their patients. Uh, I think that uh, you know, uh, previous um, uh, presenters indicated, and you know, that's the most important part, and you just can't license that. Uh, and then you train. So, um, so for example, uh, we have uh, research assistants uh, who are very inclined who have some kind of mental health training, uh, but they, uh, once they uh, start doing interviews, they get very, very uh, fearful of some of the uh, sicker patients, people patients who are suicidal or make certain threats. Um, and in fact, they usually, uh, we have to train them to get immediate attention. So that is not something that you want to uh, record and then not address immediately. Uh, and then over time, as that individual uh, uh, see these patients, uh, manages these patients, uh, they get better. So the short answer is uh, generally uh, any uh, healthcare um, provider license uh, will be sufficient. Uh, and then the most important part is that um, continued training uh, with the uh, uh, psychiatrists at the uh, receiving end to uh, improve their, their questions and management um, abilities over time. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so we will, as I stated earlier, answer the, all the questions in writing and send the answers out uh, to all the attendees. We have reached the end of our time for this webinar, so we want to thank you all for attending. For those interested in obtaining continuing education credit for participating in this webinar, please visit the URL that is shown on the screen right now. You will select today's webinar, which you will in, be indicated by the date and the title to claim your credit. You will have 14 days to claim your credit. Upon exiting today's webinar, ARC is also filled in a brief evaluation, and we hope that you will complete this survey to share your feedback with us. Thank you all very much for participating in this webinar today, and we hope that you will join us for future learning opportunities. Thank you so much.